Howdy, and welcome back to part two of our interview with Dr. Joshua Swamidas, who is Associate Professor of Pathology and Immunology at Washington University in St. Louis. Um, he is the author of The Genealogical Adam and Eve, which is available from InterVarsity Press. Dr. Swamidas, good to have you back. Great to be here. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about uh, your book and your general position on evolution, creation, you know, these words get thrown around a lot. So I think the, the best place to start is with definitions. So evolution is as slippery as a banana. Um, can you give us a brief definition of what you mean by evolution and then uh, maybe contrast that with something like Darwinism, which often gets equated uh, with the two? Yeah, and you know, it's funny that we're having a part two, and I think the reason why it's fitting is because I'd say a core part of my position is that none of the stuff that we're talking about here compares at all to who Jesus is. And so I understand that as we talk about this, this is going to create some, uh, might create some sense of conflict for some of the listeners, but just remember that the foundation of our faith isn't in these places. Uh, the only way, the reason why we care about these things is because we encountered the one who rose from the dead. So as we enter into this, is what is evolution? So evolution has meant a lot of things to different people, and you're absolutely right. It's not so much a slippery term as much as it, it means a lot of things, and it's also a stand-in for a lot of things. And so what I mean by it is uh, really common descent, which is the idea that not necessarily using universal common descent, but the key part, which I think is most theologically important and has always been the most difficult part of evolution, has been the common descent of man, as it's called, which is specifically the idea that humans alive today and chimpanzees and gorillas and bottomos, these are called the great apes, so humans and the great apes share common ancestors in the distant past, that, we're, that, we, that we have a, an ancestral connection to one another. And at the very least, I just believe that the evidence really seems to indicate that to be true or at least it's deeply predictive of that. Um, that doesn't mean that that's the whole story. I would actually say that we know it's not the whole story. It doesn't tell us anything about whether or not God was involved or how. It doesn't tell us uh, if there's some other way to make sense of this. If you take God into account, it just says that it really looks as though that humans in the great apes share a common ancestry with, with each other. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think that's pretty interesting because you know, even if you go all the way back to um, William Jennings Bryan and, the, and Huxley and their original uh, arguments, it wasn't over evolution is bad because of these, you know, mutation, natural selection and whatnot. It was because are you making me a, a monkey's uncle, basically, is kind of like the question. I guess it would be the other way around. Yeah, right? yeah. so if you look at it, so, yeah. so at that point, most fundamentalists like mm -hmm. B.B. Warfield and Manchin, mm -hmm. And uh, More the, the fundamentalist papers, mm -hmm. they were all old earth creationists. They had no problem with death in the animal kingdom. They had, I mean, none of these things were an issue. I mean, if you actually read scripture, there's no reason for them to be an issue. Uh, and they had no problem with evolution in the animal kingdom. Mm -hmm. No problem with it. The concern was what about humans? How do we handle all the issues related to humans and what it seems to be the de novo creation of Adam and Eve? So. Uh, the, and it connected to questions like original mm -hmm. sin, the image of God. So you have uh, Richard Owens 160 years ago uh, and Samuel Wilberforce mm -hmm. starting to debate with uh, uh, Huxley, who would go on in 1963 to write Man's Place in Nature. And then in the 1925, there's the debates between William Lewis Jennings Brining yeah, and, and I Scopes got this, Trial. I got those names mixed up. I was getting the Scopes Trial mixed up with the Huxley debates earlier. Um, but yeah, that, it, was, it was Wilberforce originally that was the one, right? That was super anti-evolution, I believe. Yes, Wilberforce okay. that and was Richard Owen. Okay. So Richard Owen was feeding... Uh, feeding scientific issues, so he was an anatomist at mm -hmm. the time, but um, but uh, yeah, I mean it's, it's a really beautiful story actually yeah. in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. and it turns out that if you look at the early debates between Owens and Huxley, there's something called the Great Hippocampus Question. So Huxley was arguing that humans are merely animals, no different. We're just that at a base level. And Richard Owens was saying, no, we're made in the image of God. There's uniqueness to us. And one way we're not, we know we're unique is because there's a certain part of the hippocampus that only appears in a human brain. It doesn't appear in the great apes. So here's the thing that's really interesting is that I think that Huxley ends up being right on the hippocampus. 
they ended up debating this. It was a fiasco. It involves even like a scientist pulling out a monkey brain oh and publicly dissecting it and showing you see there's a hippocampus. <laughs> <laughs> there yeah. certainly is a hippocampus in a monkey. And he intentionally chose a monkey instead of chimpanzee to really embarrass Richard Owens. But you can even see a hippocampus in you know, mice and rats that is not unique to humans. However, Richard Owens is right, is that there's things that seem to be fairly exceptional about humans. We are different, too. So there's like that tension, that paradox between the two. He was wrong about the brain, but maybe we are more different mm -hmm. than Henry Huxley really, really gave credence to. Yeah. So the, the question of common descent or common ancestry is, you know, that, that's largely separate from the question of the mechanisms, right? You know, the mutation, uh, natural selection, all, all of that stuff. Um, and it seems like in a lot of ways, people, in particular the intelligent design people, are talking past each other. People will say something like, there is overwhelming evidence for evolution. But really what they probably have in mind is, we know the chromosome 2 fused between, uh, if I'm getting this right, chimpanzees yeah, and Yeah, that's not terribly... Um that's not as impressive as the other stuff. Right. So I'll be talking to Michael Behe later tonight. He uh, w will acknowledge, actually, there's a lot of evidence for common descent from something called neutral theory. And this is actually really important because neutral theory is important because it's the first and probably most dominant example of evolutionary processes that are not Darwinian. Interesting. And, that was and, 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 and again, just for our listeners, the difference between Darwinian and just broad evolution is is so Darwinian explanations are, uh, or the mechanism is a positive selection dominated change. Okay. It doesn't mean, you know, he didn't rule out other things because that's the primary story. It turns out that, that when you look at DNA and you look at biochemical machines and all that sort of stuff, that's not actually what the dominant type of change is. We already know for a fact since 1968 when Michael Behe was in high school, I believe, that Darwinian evolution does not actually account for the complexity we see in life. We already know that. And so that's what everyone in science who knows evolutionary science thinks. So when you're arguing against Darwinian theory, it's just kind of like arguing against Newtonian mechanics as being sufficient and starting to raise questions about stuff that we're like, well, yeah. Yeah, Newtonian we mechanics. We know about the precession of, of mercury. That's part of how we think that, you know, that relativity is a better grounding for explaining these things yes we know about that but when are you gonna like kind of catch up and engage with modern physics and that's actually where i think id ends up really uh, you know really missing it in this regard and really kind of actually missing it but, but the thing about it is i actually think that they that they're in a little bit of a hard spot because they're trying to make uh, a claim that might be fairly nuanced like for example michael behe affirms common descent uh, and, 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 and you know, at times he's even acknowledged, and in certain ways he's a theistic evolutionist. Maybe he will tonight. But a large part of their base really rejects yeah. evolution. Yeah, and, and even some young Earth creationists will use Behe's work as a weapon in their arsenal almost in arguing against evolution whenever they radically disagree on many of the other science. Yeah, and you know, part of what they're doing is so part of the reason why uh, Michael Behe does that is he's, he's he's linking several comments together. I think he's the ideas together. He's linking positive selective dominated change, because in a sense that's an argument that's already been made in one. Right. Okay. <laughs> he's linking that with entirely atheistic evolution, which is certainly something that Dawkins puts forward. Right. But is not actually what science says. Science is silent about what God says, so it doesn't actually put forward evolution in that way. It just doesn't reference God, but silence shouldn't be interpreted as saying that God didn't do something. Didn't mm -hmm. really consider that a hypothesis. So, you know, he's linking those two things. Um, and it serves like a valuable rhetorical purpose because we can knock down the straw man version of evolution and have it linked to atheism, then he can create the impression that he's you know attacking atheism. But, you know, I think it's interesting public theater. It's definitely captured a lot of people's yeah. attention. It's been convincing to people. But I just don't think it's actually very good science. Yeah, so on that, you mentioned in passing something that may be really shocking news for a lot of people is that effectively Darwinism has been dead since the 60s. Yeah, yeah. well, I mean, it's not even the first time. It died soon after Darwin. There's called right. like, the death, uh, like, you know, there's like a whole phase where people are like, well, there's, we don't have any way, a mechanism, because they thought about, mm -hmm. they didn't really understand how to match the, because we didn't know what DNA was yet. Yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> And, I mean, and it really took marrying Darwinism with, um, with uh, more knowledge and right. genetics to yeah. make sense of it, right? But then the big puzzle that came up was put forward by Haldane. And it's funny mm -hmm. because creationists will reference Haldane all the time. 
as evidence against evolution. And Haldane was a secular scientist, not a creationist, who basically said, but wait a minute, when we look at all the DNA changes we see, we can't account with that positive selective change. And that was like in the early 60s. Mm -hmm. And it was a gigantic puzzle for a while. Because, okay, how do we deal with this? We can't actually do that. And, uh, and that means that Darwinism actually, or Neo-Darwinism, which is like the fusion of Darwinism right. with genetics, isn't going to work. And that was in the early 60s he writes this, okay? And, and creationists often cite Haldane. Mm -hmm. They talk about Haldane's dilemma. Interesting. But then what we find out is that in mainstream science that Kimura saw Haldane's dilemma and says, oh, here's a solution. Turns out Darwinism isn't sufficient. You were right. Yeah. It turns out that you need neutral processes, mm -hmm. and neutral processes are far more common and substantial and necessary when looking at biochemical change. And he was entirely right. And so then if you define evolution in a way that neglects neutral processes and it neglects how neutral processes interact with Darwinian processes and all that, well, then, of course, that's not sufficient. <laughs> yeah, exactly, because you're cutting out two-thirds of the theory, right? And to go a step further, you know, science doesn't really make claims of sufficiency. Sufficiency is a philosophical statement, mm -hmm. which means that this is a complete explanation. Science has never offered a complete explanation. It never intends to offer a complete explanation. Yeah. What we do is we narrow our scope to focus on the part that we can explain, and we just exclude from consideration the things that we can't explain, that we know are important. There's a term that comes up often in evolution that is critically important, it's called contingency. Mm -hmm. Contingency means things that happened that were important to the progress of evolution that we are not explaining in the current theory. Okay. An example of a contingency is when uh, what scientists, some scientists think, which might be true, there's a little bit of debate about it, of you know how all the dinosaurs decide when an asteroid came and destroyed them all. Yeah. Turns out that that might very well be incredibly important to how mammals arise and gives rise to us. If that didn't happen, maybe we wouldn't rise. That's just a possibility, right? Yeah. That contingency is really important. There's no account about how evolutionary biology explains why that asteroid came at that time. Mm -hmm. yeah, there isn't. It, yeah, it's, it's an accident of history, almost, yeah. And who's to say that God wasn't involved? There's no account for why specific mutations arise at particular times. Yeah. There's just no account. It's contingency. And so... When you realize how much is shoved into the category of contingency mm -hmm. that biology does not even seek to explain, mm -hmm. then you start wondering, well, wait a minute. It's not that there's like a tiny little place to squeeze in God. It's like it's hard to imagine how God could be guiding evolution and it would be detectable. Mm -hmm. the, the most likely thing is if God is, if we have the premise that God is guiding evolution, is that it would just be totally undetectable. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I've often pointed out pretty. Uh, throughout scripture, many of the prophets will often say that God is guiding human history. And I mean, human history is thousands of times more complicated uh, because especially if you've got free will agents involved, because you know, you're talking about literally billions of individual little stochastic Well, I wouldn't say events. thousands of times. Yeah. Complexity, you can't really measure, yeah. which is another big issue. But For you're sure. right. That's actually where I go, because like, you see these, this, like, th this double story happening even at the center of the Christian faith of the resurrection, right? Yeah. From a human point of view, Gentiles and Jews work together to murder Jesus. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, Pontius was, Pilate. And all that. We killed Jesus. That is, in some senses, a true statement. Yeah. Um, it's not just the Jews who did it. And it's not, I mean, like, everyone's hands are dirty. That's the story. And even the people who are his friends abandon him. Yeah. No one comes out looking good. Yet you know, when Jesus describes it in the garden, he, he's acting as if he has agency. Like, he is choosing to willingly lay down his life. <laughs> and so, which one is it? Did we murder him, or did he willingly lay down his life at that time in an appointed way, in a certain way? Well, you know, Jesus says that he did it. Yeah. And then, Acts 4, of course, God raised up Pontius Pilate to crucify his son. Like, there, at, at what point, you know... We don't have a detailed mechanistic yeah. account of how God did it. Yeah. And so this is the thing, you know, so uh, intelligent design comes at these things and like, can you give me a detailed mechanistic account of how a flagellum arise? Well, that's not actually what science intends to do. And he can't actually give me a detailed mechanistic account of how God designed it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And the fact of the matter is that design in a generic sense is really just supposed to be a secular replacement for the theological concept of creation. And God created everything is what we know theologically and we don't know how. He didn't tell us the precise details. 
And so we're okay with that. And in the same way, science doesn't tell us all the details. It tells us what it looks like from a scientific point of view, which is never intended to be a complete account. And so pointing out that it is not a complete account is in no way a, a threat to science. That's just what we said from the get-go. So what is the problem? Yeah. So it, it almost sounds like you're saying that intelligent design is trying to scientifically answer a theological question. Uh, and in that sense, it doesn't really... Would you say it qualifies as like unscientific? Well, so that's saying to science? motives. Um, and so certainly we can document that some people have that motive. Okay. Some people maybe don't. They think it's a, a very neutral scientific content, a thing. But I think what's going on, if you do it from that point of view, so, um, you know, if we take Michael Behe at his word, he is looking for design as a purposeful arrangement of parts uh, that, uh, that is evidence of design. But I think the issue, though, is when you apply that to something like life in biochemical machines, it has to interact with theology. Because he thinks, I mean, well, you know, we have, to, we have to really think about, you know, f for example, do we expect the way how God designs things to be similar to how we design things? That's a major theological question. Yeah, and is it we have to engage? And he yeah. says, for a purpose, we have to actually ask. Well, do we actually have a way of determining what the purpose is for this structure? And I mean, we can assign a purpose, but who? What is the purpose of that structure? Purpose is actually something that is not intrinsic to things; it is imposed from outside. You can see this all the time with my toddler when he takes things that were made for one purpose, it seems, and he uses them for another purpose. Mm -hmm. And uh, so which purpose is that thing intended for? Well, you know, that's a purpose is exp imposed externally. It's not intrinsic to things. You can't look at something and tell what its purpose is. And, and also there's this really key distinction at the heart of, of modern science between creatures and creation. Mm -hmm. And how we, from a creaturely point of view, we don't operate at the same level of an infinite, timeless God. And so when we talk about design, we have good reason to doubt that there will be strong parallels to how God designs. And in fact, what we see when we look at scripture is that the way how God designed things is not how humans would describe them. For example, I write computer code, and my students do too. I want them to document their code. There's no documentation in the genome. That's a very big way how it's not very well designed from a human point of view. Right. It's not designed for us to understand in that way. But that doesn't mean it's poor design. <laughs> it, yeah, it just means... It's just that God's purpose maybe not wasn't to put documentation in the code for us to do it. <laughs> Does that make sense? Ab yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's... You have to get to so many levels of, like, divine psychology about, like, what God design would Design psychology. Would do and, yeah, it's just kind of a mess. Now, now what happens, actually, is what, the, what uh, my friend Dr. Behe is doing is... Uh, trying to say, well, we can't do a theology there yet, or we don't know how to, or I'm just trying to say design. But to do that, you have to collapse two categories of divine design and creaturely design. And I don't think that that is theologically grounded. I think it's actually theologically dangerous. Mm -hmm. To assume that God would act in the same way we would. I also have a major objection to reducing creation to design in an engineering uh, framework. Because scripture doesn't, des doesn't describe design that way. I mean, creation that way it just doesn't do that it talks about creation creation is also a word that we apply not merely to constructing things but also to for example art creating art and i think there's a far better theological grounding for an analogy to the artist act than there is to the engineers act not to say that god doesn't engineer things but i'm talking about theologically that's right. how it is and so i think creation is the correct language to use and the fact of the matter is, scientists have no problem with you doing that. ID is actually uh, thought to be dishonest because it seems to be a stand-in for creation. So I talk about the creation of the Genova creation of Adam and Eve in my book. Yeah. And somehow people are okay with it because yeah. they feel like it's straightforward. Mm -hmm. So one thing I did want to uh, loop back onto is, um, you know, intelligent design largely is trying, in some sense, to answer the question of why the neo-Darwinian mechanisms don't work or what additional things need to be added to it. Which uh, is already said like a, a solved problem. Yeah, 
Now, there's another movement which I kind of recently extended learned. Extended synthesis? Yeah, the extended synthesis. Well, yeah, so, so that they're kind of like the secular version of ID. That is, the problem isn't them, isn't, I mean, there is a little bit of, a bit of you know, whatever. The consensus <laughs> yeah. is to be yes. It's not, it's not actually a problem of pseudoscience. It's actually a problem of pseudo-history. Interesting. So they uh, are pointing to several things that are already widely accepted. Okay. <laughs> within evolutionary science and saying well then therefore we need a total revision but wait a minute those are already there okay what is the problem we already have an extended synthesis is what the nature uh di debate said on the opposite side we already have an extended synthesis with a lowercase e a lowercase s the debate is merely about whether or not to capitalize those two letters <laughs> okay so so in in this case as opposed to the grand modern synthesis which took mendelian genetics and uh darwinist uh mechanism, Dabonsky. yeah and mush, uh, mush those together. The extended synthesis. Well, they mush. I mean, it kind of. Or, sorry. Yeah. I, I, synthesize I, I, them. Exactly. Synthesize. Yeah. And brought them together, married them, if you will. The extended synthesis. What they're saying is, we need to do something similar, but historically, that's already been done, just in increments. Yeah. Well, I mean, okay. I, I'd say key thing was Kimura. Okay. Kimura was a key part of that, and then Ota Tamako, one of a woman, a female scientist, actually mm -hmm. a woman. Um, out in Japan was a key part of this, you know. Interesting. Um, we just had Darwin's Day um, last year. Um, I let a young Earth creationist publish on People's Peace of Science why we should probably start calling it Darwin's Day, and I actually agree with him. And it's funny. There's a bit of a debate um, mm -hmm. with some evolutionary science, including some atheist scientists and um, atheist uh, evolutionary uh, graduate students too. It was it was fun a conversation, and one of them, who's not actually a Christian, said, "Okay, what we need is something to the effect of." And I'm going to butcher the precise way what we said. Is we need something like you know a Darwin, Wallace, <laughs> <laughs> Kimura, Ota, yeah. and he strung together a Margolis yeah. day <laughs> instead of evolution. I said, well, yeah, that would be better because evolution is a lot bigger than Darwin. Mm -hmm. Already, it's been extended. So what is the problem? Yeah. And if the issue is just that we need to extend it with another mechanism, well, by all means, write a paper and show us the evidence for it and let us include it and let us start asking the relative importance of these things. But we already know definitively when it comes to biomolecular and genetic change that Darwinian methods and mechanisms are the minor, minor con contribution to it. Yeah. I mean, you say this like it's not controversial, but it's not. But to so many people, you would think that you know, evolution equals Darwinism equals randomness. Well, so this gets yeah. to, uh, this is why I think it's important because what I said is entirely controversial. It's also entirely surprising. And that's because I had been fed on the, you know, uh, you know, the, the trough of young earth creationism and ID for so many years. And I, then I found out it was, you know, I found out like literally in, in sometimes like 10 minute conversations talking to an actual scientist, an actual biologist. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, wait a minute. What they're saying evolutionary theory is, is not actually evolutionary theory. Yeah. So wait a minute. What are they arguing against then? And you start looking at it and say, oh, wait a minute. So maybe what they're actually saying is true, that that version of evolution is false. But wait a minute. That's not actually what's being put forward by evolutionary scientists. So what exactly is going on? And you know, you can interpret it however you want, but whatever it is, it is not actually any sort of real counter to evolutionary science as it's understood by current evolutionary scientists. Interesting. I, I mean, that, that's totally fascinating to me because I'm, I'm in the same boat, you know. I, for the longest time, like, I, I thought that evolution was just Darwinian, random, and that's it. Uh, and you can't have that in a theological system, so something something's wrong. But then, you know, you read uh, all the stuff surrounding, what was it, that, that meeting a couple years ago, the Royal Society? Uh, and, and it sounds like that was a bunch of extended synthesis people that kind of put yeah, it's together. Yeah, it's a debate about capitalizing letters. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I mean, so basically, there, the majority, I mean, so there, there might be debate about individual mechanisms and the relative importance of them, but the mm -hmm. only reason why it's important is because they're trying to capitalize the letters and take credit for that capitalization. Yeah, so... I actually earlier today we talked with Dr. Behe, um, and he we asked him about the the, the the same society thing, and he said that everyone there was at pains to say I am not an intelligent design theorist. I'm just trying to explain this particular whatever part of their theory was, and it sounds like from uh, from what you've told me is basically that it's inner public consciousness that if you oppose Darwinism, you must be intelligent design in some sense. Well, no, no, what's going on is something different there because. Uh, you know, 
evolutionary in the Senate evolutionary synthesis I told you they're trying to capitalize those letters there's also they have there's also something called the third way oh yes and yeah. so they're including ID people within the third way really I didn't know and that. so I mean there's actually a very good reason for scientists to be saying like what the heck is going on here and so they're they're not merely making I mean so think about it if it's about capitalizing letters mm -hmm. that's not actually a scientific argument right so they're making a cultural argument Okay, that makes and a lot more sense. And they're and they're making doing that in a way. That's why they're kind of in this space, and and it's actually disputed. So that's why some people are saying, well, you know, these ex these other mechanisms are important. But let me be clear, I have a problem with those ID people that are that are being <laughs> that are kind of latching onto this. This has nothing to do with ID, even though they're kind of like hanging out in the space. So that I mean, you know, that that's kind of a poison pill for them. Okay. And um, you know, it's and so ID likes it. Because I think it kind of supports the narrative that there's these intransigent Darwinists, even though none of them describe themselves as Darwinists. Right, they would. That are opposing yeah. anything that shows that Darwinism defined as natural selection dominated change, except for none of them think that yeah. <laughs> is the complete account. When that's just not what's going on. It's literally a debate about capitalizing letters. That is legitimately interesting because I kind of kind of flirt with that sort of extended synthesis way of thinking because I've always kind of thought, yeah, the, the Darwinian picture has never made sense to me. But the Darwin picture is but false. It, yeah, it's been false for a long time. <laughs> so Darwin is dead and we have killed him. So how do you learn about that? So uh, what I tell you is to look up Moto Kimura and actually read about non-Darwinian processes like neutral drift and neutral draft. There's an article I wrote that's a peaceful science called Cancer and Evolution that explains some of this. And there's uh, a lot of really good uh, articles about neutral theory. And if you're concerned about this because you think uh, that, well, this is just evolutionary science and yada, yada. Well, yeah, it is evolutionary science. But what's interesting about this is because neutral theory does not seek to explain how innovation arises and how new features arise in, in, uh, in different organisms, this is a component of science that actually is widely accepted across the origins debate, including by ID people, by young earth creationists like John Sanford and Rob Carter, and also by old earth creationists like Reasons to Believe and others, and certainly by evolutionary creationists as well. It is demonstrable in the laboratory, demonstrable by theory, demonstrable by simulations. And once you start to understand these basics of population genetics, just a lot of stuff starts to make sense. So check that out. Come check it out at Peaceful Science. PeacefulScience.org is the place to go. Well, thank you so much for uh, talking about this and killing Darwin again. We look forward to Well, not Darwin. Oh, Darwin. He was already dead. Darwin has already been dead, yes. And Dar I didn't do anything. I'm just letting you know the actual history, <laughs> getting past the pseudo history. Right? I got you. All right. Well, in the next part, we will finally talk about this book that you've alluded Take to. Take three. Yeah. This uh, book you've alluded to, The Genealogical uh, Adam and Eve. So we'll see you next time. Thanks for listening to this episode. Think Theism is made in association with Russia Christie at Texas A&M University. We invite you to join the weekly Russia Christie meetings every Thursday at 8.30 p.m. The views and opinions that are expressed in all of our episodes are of the speakers only and are not necessarily endorsed by Russia Christie nor by Texas A&M University. For more information, go to thinktheism.org.